If you have your Bibles tonight, turn to the book of Philippians. We'll go to chapter 4. Philippians chapter 4. And the, the title they gave me was Money, Dollars, and Cents. And I have the, the opportunity on a daily basis based on uh, the business that we run, Legacy Retirement Group. Um, we get to talk with people about their money all the time. And we talk more in the lines of a budget or we talk in lines of, you know, will they have enough to uh, maintain their way of living through retirement? We do, we do those kind of things. We're not going to talk about any of those kinds of things tonight. We're going to talk about more of what the Bible has to say about money. And in Philippians chapter 4, verse 11, the Bible says, Not that I speak in respect of want, for I have learned in whatsoever state I am therewith to be content. I know both how to be abased and I know how to abound. Everywhere and in all things I am instructed both to be full and to be hungry, both to abound and to suffer need. I can do all things through Christ, which strengtheneth me. Now, most of us are familiar with verse 13. I can do all things through Christ, which strengtheneth me. But we don't really take it in the context of what God was talking about prior to that. And he's talking about how we live. He's talking about our possessions. He's talking about our sustenance. He's talking about how you and I live from day to day. And, and, and most of us in, the, in this room tonight could, could talk about both of those. You know how to be abased. You know how to struggle. You know what it's like to try to figure out how to, how to pay the bills. You know what it's like to have a month left but no money. Uh, there's, there's all those things that, that most of us, at least some point in our life, have struggled with those things. And then we know how to abound. It's nice when we can abound and we're not worried about money. It's nice to be at a place where we can pay our bills and not necessarily have to go to God and say, God, help me pay this electric bill or God, help me pay this gas bill. Uh, but in all those things, we should say, I can do it all. I can, I can learn how to be abased. I can learn how to abound through Jesus Christ. And what's interesting as I was doing this study, I realized that there's 2,350 verses in the Bible that refer to money and how we use it and our possessions. And there are times when we have plenty. There are times when we have little or our money is scarce. But what, what was also interesting as I started looking into this is that the Bible only refers to faith, and prayer 500 times, but yet he refers to money 2,350 times. So why do you think that is? Well, I believe it's because God knows this, that our attitude towards money is an indication of where our heart is in relationship with our God. So I can remember times in my younger days, thankfully not recently, but in my younger days where I was in college, and that was my much younger days. And I was in college, and, and I had a job that I worked full-time, and I went to school full-time, but yet uh, it was sometimes a struggle just to pay my college tuition. And I can remember, you know, being on my knees, praying God help me uh, supply my need so that I can pay my next tuition payment. You know, I'm working full-time, you know, you know how you do when you pray and you, you try to talk God into things? And, and so I'm praying, God, you know, I'm working full time and I'm doing my best to get through school and I'm, I'm, really, I'm really trying my hardest. God, you know that, that I need this and I, <laughs> I'm trying to talk him into it. God, provide. And, and sometimes it would be at the very last moment, somehow, some way, God would meet my need. But it was never the way I thought it would be. And it was quite a struggle. And to be honest, I didn't really enjoy the struggle. But what I really enjoyed was when God came through and met the need. And I'll talk about that more tonight. But, but what did that allow me to do? That allowed me to trust my God in relationship to what he was providing. And you know, the difficult thing is when we don't agree with God about how he's providing. Have you ever disagreed with God about that? 
I won't ask you to raise your hand, but have you ever bought a lottery ticket? <laughs> Thinking, God, and, and I know that I've done this in the past, and God, if I just, if I just won this, and, and the boys were talking about this in the car the other day, if, if I had, Cameron, if I had a billion dollars, I would be able to do this for the Lord, and I would buy you a new place. And <laughs> he, in his mind, he was trying to figure out, okay, what am I going to do if I had a billion dollars? Of course, there was some sort of fun car associated with that conversation. But the Apostle Paul here tells us, I know how to abound, and I know how to be abased, but I can do all things through Christ which strengtheneth me. So, here's a question for us, though. Is our obedience to God concerning money determined by how much we have. One of the classic examples in the Bible is the widow who had two mites. I don't know exactly how much two mites was, but it wasn't a lot. It was less than two cents in our economy today. And she goes in and she gives her two mites, which was all that she had. And, and God took notice because Here was this lady who had very, very little. At that moment, financially, you could say that this lady was abased. But yet, she was willing to trust God with everything she had. That doesn't mean that God's going to ask us to give in the offering plate every penny we have. But what that means is our attitude towards God of trusting Him regardless of how much we have. God... If, if, I'm, if I'm abounding and, and, you know, I've got my stimulus checks and I've got plenty in the bank and I've got some extra and, God, I feel real good about it. Uh, I feel like I'm abounding right now. God, I feel pretty comfortable. I can, I, can, I can do my part. But on the other side, I'm, I'm, I'm not feeling like things are going my way. And, God, you know I'd give if I could. God, you know I'd trust you if I just had a little more. But that's not what the Apostle Paul is trying to teach us here. He's trying to teach us that we can do all things through Christ, that we can trust Him with our money. And our relationship with Him, in many cases, is, is directly linked to our attitude towards our money and how we respond to Him with our money. Our relationship with money is an indication of our relationship with our God. So, God God has his part in all this, and turn with me, if you would, to Genesis chapter 14, and we're going to read verse 22, Genesis chapter 14, verse 22. The Bible says this, and Abram said to the king of Sodom, I have lift up mine hand unto the Lord, the most high God the possessor of heaven and earth. So one of the most important things for us to understand about our possessions, about our money, is that everything belongs to God. God owns everything. If we look at Psalm 24, verse um, verse, um, 12 through 14, I think it is, the earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof, the world and they that dwell therein. So he tells us that God is the possessor of heaven and of earth. He tells us that the earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof. In other words, all the bounty that's provided here on earth belongs to God. And if you would, turn to Ezekiel chapter 16, because I find this passage to be really interesting when it comes to what we have. Ezekiel chapter 16, verses 17 through 20. The Bible says this, Thou hast also taken thy fair jewels of my gold and my silver, which I had given thee, and madest to thyself images of men, and didst commit whoredom with them, and tookest thy broidered garments, and coverest them, Thou hast set mine oil and mine incense before them, my meat also which I gave thee, 
fine flour and oil and honey wherewith I fed thee, thou hast even set it before them for a sweet savor, and thus it was, saith the Lord God. Moreover, thou hast taken thy sons and thy daughters whom thou hast borne unto me, and these hast thou sacrificed unto them to be devoured. Is this of thy whoredoms a small matter? So God isn't talking necessarily about sexual sin here. What God's talking about is not, the, is not taking the things that he's given us and using it properly. So what's he talking about? He said, heaven belongs to me. He says, earth belongs to me. He says, our gold and our silver belongs to God. He says, the, the animals I've provided for you belong to me. He said, our clothing, the, the broidered garment, he said, that belongs to me. He says, our children belong to him. In other words, everything belongs to God. And so what, what was he talking about there when he says whoredoms? When we are taking the blessings of God and putting it on the altar of something else. That's exactly what he's talking about. It could be the altar of self-indulgence. It could be the altar of waste. It could be the altar of, of whatever possession that we must own or have. And, and there's nothing wrong with owning or having possessions. There's nothing wrong with those types of things. But what God is saying is, look, the most important principle you need to understand about me is I own everything. Everything belongs to me. So it's difficult. Why? Because we go out and we work a job. And who gives us the health to work that job? God does. Who supplied that job? God did. Who gave us the transportation to get to that job? God did. And so, who gave us the mind that was sharp enough and wise enough to be able to handle that job? God did. And so, God's saying, look, I've given you all the resources, the earth, the heavens, gold, silver. I've given you your children. I've given you your food. I've given you animals. I've given you everything that you have. He said, all I want you to do is take notice that it belongs to me. That's all I want you to do. I just want you to acknowledge that everything that you have came from me. What's the Bible say? Every good gift and every perfect gift comes from where? From above. It comes from Him. And before I came uh, here tonight, I got home maybe about 20 minutes before six or so. And my lovely wife sitting down here, she made sure that I had a meal. Now I could eat every bit of that meal and never say thank you. In fact, I could go home every night and eat my meal and never say thank you, never say, as my mother would say, yakum. <laughs> That's he never even said yakum. I don't know what yakum is, but it, somehow my mother gets offended when people don't say it. But uh, ne- never, <laughs> never, acknowledge, never acknowledge the fact that she prepared a wonderful meal. And God's, God's the same way. He's like, I don't mind providing everything that you need. He said, I'd just like you to look up towards heaven and, and with gratitude and acknowledge the fact that it came from me. So everything truly belongs to God. Have you ever thought about that? God wants us to understand that. Second of all, God controls every event. Have you ever wondered why things happen the way they do? Have you ever wanted something so badly you could taste it, but it didn't happen? In some cases, maybe you're disappointed. Other cases, maybe you even got upset with God a bit about something not happening. And have you ever gone back later and realized how wonderful it was that God did not allow that to happen? I have. 
I have over and over and over again. You see, God knows what I need. And so God, in His infinite wisdom, controls every event. So there's nothing that happens in our life that God doesn't have control over if you and I will just yield ourselves to Him. And it comes true with our money. God doesn't necessarily want everything we have. He just wants to know that we're willing to yield it to Him. It does belong to Him. And we should acknowledge that it does. We should acknowledge where it came from. But most importantly, God wants us to realize that He controls every event. So therefore, we should never be bitter at God about our circumstance. Remember what I opened up with tonight? I said, look, the Apostle Paul indicated to us that he knows how to abound. He knows how to have success. And he also knows how to be abased. He he knows how to struggle. And most everyone in this room tonight are probably going through one of those phases right now. You're either struggling or things are going really well for you. You're abounding or right now you feel abased. But you know, God knows. God knows your circumstance. And many times, at least I've found in my life, God tests us. And I always want to pass God's test because he always, you know, in school, I hated it when I had to retake a test. I hate it worse when I have to retake God's test. (laughs) I hate it. And I've had to do it many, many times in my Christian life, more times than I like to admit. So when we understand that God is in control of every event and that whatever's happening in our life is happening for a purpose even when it comes and relates to our finances. And even events that we cause ourselves, sometimes God, many times God intervenes even on our behalf and gets us through the things that we struggle with that are really of our own doing. So, God controls every event. Thirdly, God provides. I love this. Look at Philippians chapter 4, verse 19. Philippians chapter 4, verse 19. But my God shall supply all your need according to his riches in glory by Christ Jesus. I love that verse. All my need is supplied by my God, according not to my riches, but according to His riches and glory by Christ Jesus. And I can, over and over and over again in my life, I can testify to that. Sometimes it's a financial need, and sometimes it's a spiritual need. Sometimes it's just a a word of encouragement Sometimes it's a message from Pastor Tony or from someone. But God has a way of supplying our needs. So God does provide. Romans chapter 11, verse 36, the Bible says this, For of Him and through Him and to Him are all things. To whom be glory forever. Amen. So God deserves credit for everything good that happens in my life. He deserves the credit for it. He has supplied the need. And so now we look and say everything belongs to God. God is in control of every event. And now we understand that it's God that provides. How does that change our attitude towards our God when we're going through a struggle? How does that change our relationship? Not very often, but... Kristen and I might have a struggle from time to time. Well, we have had struggles, just different types. And how we accept that struggle and how we choose to address that struggle will determine how our relationship is. Now, I'm, I'm, kind, of a, I'm kind of a patient guy for the most part. 
it takes a lot to uh, push my buttons, so to speak. Um, and so I don't allow, and for the most part, little things to cause big problems. But I think many times we forget that God is the one that owns everything and that God's the one who controls the circumstance and God's the one who provides and he's the one that meets the needs. And we allow the struggles that happen to cause bitterness to enter our heart. It can, and by the way, that can happen in any relationship. We can get bitter in any relationship, even in our relationship with God, if we're going through a struggle and we, we don't allow God to get us to the other side. We don't allow God to work his way in our life because that struggle could be for something great that God has in mind for us. We don't know what that is. Now, what does that have to do with money? Everything. Because it's financial struggles that cause us some of the largest grief in our Christian lives. Or how we deal with money or, or our attitude towards money or our attitude towards God when we're going through a struggle when it comes to our finances. You see, we can be content when we trust God that He knows what's best in every circumstance. You may have come tonight thinking, oh, He's going to talk about how to craft the, just the right budget. <laughs> and there's a time for that. Or, you know, how do I set... How do I set investments or priorities or things like that? And there's a time for that too. And God does give us wisdom in making those choices. But I think more importantly is our attitude towards our God as it relates to our money. I think that's more important that we get that set and we understand. I, I can remember when I was an associate pastor years ago in Memphis, Tennessee. And you know, I went to Bible college and I worked at a steel processing plant and my last year in college, I made $25,000, which was decent for a college student. So my first position as an assistant pastor, and by the way, I thought college was a struggle for me because I, I was just working, I was trying to get through school, I struggled. And it took me longer than, than many to finish school, but I did, finally. And, and I had this idea in my head, as soon as I graduate from college, everything's going to be easy. Because college was such a struggle. And so I took my first position as an assistant pastor in Tennessee, and I went from a $25,000 salary working through working hourly through college to $17,000 as my first position. And I can recall struggling. It was a different kind of struggle because now I couldn't work overtime. Well, they, they did work me overtime. There just wasn't extra pay for it. And, uh, and I can remember doing the giving that God laid in my heart and paying my bills and, and, and doing all those things. But there wasn't any money left for groceries. There was no money left. And I remember praying about that and asking God, I said, God, I, I don't know what I'm going to do. I don't have anything left. And I can remember still this, one of the sweetest ladies in the church just stopped by the house with about $300 worth of groceries. Now, this was back in the late 1980s. That was a lot of groceries. I thought, wow. You see, God could supply my need better than I could supply my need. And so what I learned from that situation was that, okay, here I was, I felt like I was a base. Oh, poor me, I can't, <laughs> can't buy groceries. But that gave God an opportunity to abound, which in my life was a wonderful testimony of, I can trust God for anything. 
Sometimes we give up on God and we don't let Him work in our lives so we don't get the benefit of seeing God work in such a way that He gives, He, he cements in our hearts our ability to trust Him. Now, why is that so important? Because we talked about God's part. God owns everything. God has control of every circumstance. God provides. Well, what about our part? What is our part? Our part is to put God first. That's our part. So look at the book of Colossians, chapter number one. Colossians, chapter number one. The Bible says this, and he is the head of the body, verse 18, and he is the head of the body, the church, who is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, that in all things he might have the preeminence. Now, preeminence is is a long word, meaning he wants first place. He wants the priority. That's exactly what it means. And so one of the things that God wants to know is that he comes first. He comes first. In every area of our lives, by the way, not just when it comes to money, but that's one of the, that's one of the areas in which he desires from us. 2,350 times in the Bible, he reminds us that he wants to be first when it comes to our finances. It's important to him. Over four, um, nearly five times as many times as he talked about faith and he talked about prayer, he talked about our money. So he wants to be first in our desires. He wants to be first in all our relationships. He wants to be first in our life's goals. He wants to be first in our careers. But yeah, he also wants to be first when it comes to our money. In the book of Proverbs, chapter 3, verse 9, the Bible says this, Honor the Lord with thy substance. What is substance? It's all our stuff. And with the first fruits of all thine increase. Not just income, increase. So, what is he saying here? He wants us to put him first, he wants to be the priority. He wants, to, he wants us to honor him. So, what does it mean to honor? The word honor literally means to place value upon. To place value upon. So, just like the the Bible says, honor thy father and thy mother. Do I have a perfect mother? No. But I don't show her honor because she's perfect. I show her honor because she's my mother. And God says to show him respect with our substance, with our stuff. That goes back to what he is, right? He's the one who owns everything. He's the one that controls our circumstance. He's the one that provides. So he says, because I do these things, I own everything. I control your circumstances. I provide for you because of those things you should honor me with your substance and the first fruits of all thine increase so the word honor here means to be honorable to be chargeable and to glorify to be honorable to be chargeable and to glorify the word substance means riches Wealth and possessions. That's exactly what it means. The word first fruits means this, to be first in line. Increase is our production and our income. So what's he saying? He wants us to glorify him with our possessions so that he is always first in line of everything that we receive. That's exactly what that verse is saying. So what does that mean? That means, have you ever heard, now I hate to say such a dirty word in church, but the word budget. 
So when we fill out our budget, what do we put first? Do we put our house payment, our rent? Is it our car payment? Is it direct TV? Is it our cellular bill? What, what's first? What would we never do without? Well, what God wants is He wants us to put Him on the first line. He wants to be first. So what happens, this is important, what happens if we put God first and then what, what literally should come next is our, is our things we can't really do without, like a place to live, right? So that should come next. And it's nice to eat every once in a while. So all of our bills should come next. Things like food, necessities should be next. And then what would come next in our budget would be anything that we could do without, like a direct TV, a a cellular phone. Now, I, I would prefer not to do without my cellular phone. It's nice to be able to communicate. It's nice to be able to pull things up. It's, you know, in fact, I think some people would trade their children before they'd trade their phone. But uh, the phone doesn't always talk back. But um, (laughs) that's easy for someone to say. It's hard to put into practice sometimes. So what is our priority would we pay everything, make sure, oh, DirecTV's got to be paid, oh, got to pay AT&T, um, Friday's pizza night, that's a non-negotiable, um, you know, got to keep, every, keep everything in line here, right? And so we put all those things in line and all of a sudden, uh-oh, God, I'm sure you'll understand there's no money left for you. God doesn't understand. He said, wait a minute. I'm the one that created everything. You remember heaven and earth and I gave you your children and I gave you your health and I gave you your job and oh, you mean I'm not that important? That's what we're telling God when we don't put Him first. So, honor the Lord with thy substance and with the first fruits of all thine increase. So why am I teaching this? Because if we put God in his proper place and we, we really understand that everything does come from him, it shouldn't be that difficult to say, God, you come first. Certainly. If my wife prepares these wonderful meals and I come home and I thank somebody else for them. How many meals do you think I'm going to get next week? <laughs> like, stop at Chick-fil-A, you know? No, not just kidding. She wouldn't do that. But, but you get what I'm saying? God says, look, could you just go ahead and honor me and put me first and see what I'm going to do? So God wants to know that he comes first when it comes to our money. How do we show God that he comes first? By obedience. How do you know your children are listening to you? My mother used to say to me, she'd say, I'm not going to tell you another time. In my head, I'm thinking, good, because I'm tired of hearing it, but no. (laughs) I've talked to you till till I'm blue in the face, right? How many have heard those things? Yes. And God says, in Malachi, He says, For I am the Lord, I change not. Therefore, you sons of Jacob, are not consumed. Even from the days of your fathers, ye are gone away from mine ordinances and have not kept them. Return unto me, and I will return unto you, saith the Lord of hosts. But ye said, Wherein shall we return? Will a man rob God? 
Yet ye have robbed me. But you say, wherein have we robbed thee? In tithes and offerings. Ye are cursed with a curse, for ye have robbed me, even this whole nation. Bring ye all the tithes into the storehouse. That doesn't mean Coles or, you know, Macy's. Uh, bring, ye, bring ye all the tithes into the storehouse, that there may be meat in mine house, and prove me now herewith. I love that part, and prove me now herewith, saith the Lord of hosts. If I will not open you the windows of heaven and pour you out a blessing, that there shall not be enough room to receive it. I love that. God says, if you'll just obey, then I'm going to pour out a blessing. At our house, the blessing is, you know, with, if our kids obey, they don't get the wrath of mom or <laughs> they don't get the wrath of dad, right? So, um, or they do not get, you know, the, the frustration, you know, explosion. Of course, God doesn't explode on us based on frustration, like we might on our kids. But God does say here in verse 9, he says, ye are cursed with a curse, for ye have robbed me. Now, the word robbed is though we went to God at gunpoint and held him hostage. That's a strong word. When we fail to put God first, it's like we are strong-arming God and we're nearly forcing him to judge us. Have you ever spanked a child and you're like, well, I didn't want to do this, but you gave me no, what? Choice. Choice. And God looks down on us when we're disobedient in, in, the, in the area of our money and he says, I don't want to do this, but you've given me no choice. I don't want to judge you. I don't want to curse you. But I've provided you with health and I provided you with a job and I provided you with uh, healthy children and I provided you with a means to support your family and I, I provided you with everything you need and all I asked was a tenth of that as a show of respect. So if you're not willing to acknowledge me in that way and trust me in that way, then you're going to be cursed with a curse. Now, I don't know what that curse means. I do know this. I made a pact, a vow, a, an agreement with God when I was just a teenager that I would tithe. I heard someone preach about it and I was under conviction because I, was, I had a paper route and I would saved all my money from my paper route for a car. My first car was a 67 Chevelle. And uh, yes, and I love that car. But I had, I had enough money set aside for that car. And then I went and I listened to this preacher. And he taught me, he said, if you've been disobeying God, and I'm not going to go into that scripture for time right now, but he said, you owe the fifth part. What's, what's that mean? In, order, in, other, in other words, if I want to make things right with God in, in regards to my giving, I actually owe God interest. A fifth part. Now, what is a fifth? A tenth is 10%. A fifth is how much? 20%. 20 right? Because if you divide 100 by 5, it is 20. So not only do I owe God what I stole from Him, but now I owe him interest of 20%. It's like the credit card company. Only God will bless me if I'm obedient. So I listened to that message. And God, I mean, I was only 13 years old, maybe. 13 and a half when I heard that message. And I can remember God gripping my heart in in. in realizing really for the first time I'd been stealing from God. And I remember going to the altar and I was crying, you know, and all that. And I had to go back home and I had to take that money that I had saved for a car. And most of it I had to give 
to God because it's that was the money. It wasn't money that wasn't my money to use for a car. It was money that I'd stolen from God because I wasn't tithing. Now, when we put God first in our finances, our money, by being obedient with our tithes and offerings, then God promises to bless us. I love that verse 10. Bring ye all the tithes into the storehouse that there may be meat in mine house. Improve me now herewith, saith the Lord of hosts. If I will now open the windows of heaven and pour you out a blessing that there shall not be room enough to receive it. I don't believe the blessings that are in my life today are because I'm smart. I don't believe they're in my life because I'm exceptional. I believe they're in my life because I've been obedient to God in regards to my finances. And I can tell you of times in my life, I could go through a few examples where things were tight and I chose not to tithe. And I can tell you that the price I paid was way worse (laughs) than the tithe. And you may say, well, that's just a coincidence. Maybe you think that, but I don't. I, I, I believe what God says. Amen. So a tithe is 10%. One of my pastors growing up used to say this, and I believe it. A tithe is a debt that we owe. The offering is a seed that we sow. And there's times that, Kristen can tell you, there's times that God lays something on my heart. And I always talk to her about it. Or there's times God lays something on her heart and she'll talk to me about it. And our response to each other is always, well, if God's laying that on your heart, then, then why would I not be in agreement? And that's not, God, by the way, you don't have to have tithing laid on your heart. That's already a command. But God may tell you to help someone out. God may impress upon you. There might be a missionary that comes speaks and God lays something on my heart. Whatever it is, if God lays it on my heart, I'm afraid not to listen. I'm just afraid not to. So, but I've heard some people say in recent years, well, tithing is in the Old Testament. So therefore, I don't really need to tithe. It's like like really a defense attorney trying to get someone off. Uh, I I don't really want to treat my God that way. I don't want to feel like, okay, is there some obscure scripture here that gets me off from tithing? But God's already told me to honor him with the first fruits of all my increase. He's already told me what, what, what he expects. But in Matthew, I'm sorry, Malachi 3 verse 6, it says, I am the Lord, I change not. But then I, I just thought about that for, for a little bit. And I thought, well, you know, there's other verses in the Old Testament Like in Exodus chapter 20, verse 13, it says, Thou shalt not kill. So is it okay to kill because that was in the Old Testament? I don't think so because in Matthew chapter 5, verse 21 and 22, it says, Ye have heard that that it was said of them of old time, Thou shalt not kill. And whosoever shall kill shall be in danger of the judgment. But I say unto you, that whosoever is angry with his brother without a cause shall be in danger of judgment. You see, whatever God gave us as part of the, the um, plumb line, the law of the Old Testament, he's carried out to a further extent now that we're under grace in the New Testament. Now that we have the grace of God through Jesus Christ, our Savior, we're held to a higher standard, not a lower standard. And we could take that of... Um, Exodus chapter 20, verse 14, thou shalt not commit adultery. So does it mean it's okay because that was in the Old Testament? No. In in Matthew chapter 5, verses 27 and 28, it says, ye have heard that it was said of them of old time, thou shalt not commit adultery. But I say unto you, that whosoever looketh on a woman to lust after her hath committed adultery already in her heart. You see, God God didn't change just because we're under grace today. God still expects us to obey him. He just holds us to a higher standard. 
In fact, he says that in 2 Corinthians chapter two, uh, chapter 9, verse 7, he says, Every man according as he purposeth in his heart, so let him give, not grudgingly or of necessity, for God loveth a cheerful giver. So what's, what's God saying? He's saying, now that you're under grace, I don't want giving to be a burden. I don't want it to be a shackle that's, that you're carrying around like a weight. I don't want you to feel like this is just a law or a command. What I hope will happen because of the relationship that you have available with me is that you will realize that I own everything. That you'll realize that I'm in control of every circumstance. That you realize that I'm the one who provides. That you'll realize that I've given you everything that you have and so therefore out of your tremendous love and honor for me that you do not feel that it's a duty under a command to give. I love to buy my wife gifts. I don't do so because I feel it's a duty. When her birthday comes around and I plan things, it's not out of duty. I love doing it. Why? Because I love her. And God says, what I want you to do, He says, I want you to fall in love with me so that when it comes time to honor me with the first fruits of everything you have, it is not a burden. But it's an it's a inner desire that you have to give back to me because you love me so much. That's what New Testament giving is about. So that's why he says, every man according as he purposeth in his heart, let him so give. Not grudgingly or of necessity, for God loveth a cheerful giver. Now I've heard some say, if you can't give, just give God a little. Just start by giving something. I don't agree with that. Why don't I? Because it's not in the Bible. It's not in the Bible. No, I think what God would rather you do, turn off your cable, get rid of your cell phone, sell your car and take the bus, and put him first. When I made $17,000 a year, I didn't even own a television. Why? Because I couldn't afford one. I bought a car, sold a car, bought a car, sold a car. Why? Because I couldn't afford the payment. <laughs> I couldn't afford the payment. So I bought them and sold them regularly so I wouldn't have a payment. Isn't that terrible? It actually worked. I actually made a few extra dollars, but, uh, and God got part of that. So, God doesn't want our tithe. He wants our heart. The tithe is just the beginning. That's why he says, as you purpose in your heart. Has God, have you allowed God, have we allowed God to grab a hold of our heart in relationship to money. And we allow ourselves to fall in love with Him so much that giving just comes naturally because of our relationship with Him. So I said early in the, in the uh, lesson tonight that our obedience to God concerning money is an indication of our relationship with Him. And that's all it is, folks. It's a relationship. Money is a tool. It's just a tool that God has given us, just like any other tool. Our children 
our tools and our hands that we get to use. We get to mold and shape and love and, and guide. Our money is something that's a tool in our hand and we can use it only for ourselves. We can use it to further God's work. We can use it to be a blessing to others. We can use it for so many things, but it's just a tool. That's all it is. And money, by the way, is an outlet for worship. It's a way. You know, I love worshiping the Lord in song. My boys will tell you that I have a song for everything. And if I don't know a song for it, I'll make it up. Just like that can be worship. When you, when you are in love with your Savior, and God says, be a blessing to that brother, be a blessing to that sister, in the moment you obey God in that way, you're honoring your Savior, and that's a form of worship. When you further the cause of Christ by your giving, that, ladies and gentlemen, is a form of worship. So don't look at, don't, money's more than dollars and cents, which is, by the way, the, the title of this lesson tonight. I was sharing with someone in my office today a concept. And the concept for many people is that the only way to make money and grow your money is in the stock market. And I was actually showing him how when you are planning for income and things like that, how by taking some away and protecting it and then growing the rest, how you end up with more. And I actually have a software that illustrates it and it, it kind of opened the eyes of someone today. But you know, the same thing's true with our money in relationship to God. When we take what God has required and we give it to Him, we end up with more. It's hard to comprehend. One of my men that was a mentor that I respected as a young person, his name was Russell Anderson. He, he is a, the co-founder of Hiles Anderson College where I went to college. And he had a drywall business and God kept blessing him and blessing him and he kept giving and kept giving. And the last time I sat down and had lunch with Russell Anderson, he shared with me, he said, Greg, he said, God has blessed me so much that now I give 90% to missions and I keep 10%. He said, and he said, I can't give it away fast enough. God keeps blessing me with more. And I hope that you'll grasp this principle when it comes to godly handling of money. That God's entrusted you with just a resource. It's our heart and our attitude about that resource in relationship to God that will determine really how God uses it through us. 